Hi, I'm Robert Sachs, and you are listening to Civility Speaks. This is podcast number six, and I um, want to talk about some issues. What I've been doing is I've been going back and forth between the two main characters of my book in the Path of Civility, back and forth between George Washington and some of the rules that he uh, lived by and practiced by with respect to how he addressed people and handled people in his life as a president, as a person, and then the Buddha and the teachings of the Buddha in terms of how it impacts our ability to communicate effectively with each other. So today, what I'm going to do, because last week what I did was look at one of the rules of civility, I'm going to go back to the teachings of the Buddha. In the teachings of the Buddha, commonly known as the Dharma, which means the way things are, there are essentially four levels of compassion or compassionate action. They are described as peaceful or pacifying, enriching or educational, magnetizing and destroying forms of compassion. That last one, destroying, sounds a bit heavy, so I use the term wrathful, and wrathful is used also in Buddhist texts to describe that form of compassion. And basically the idea is that there are ways in which we approach situations with compassion in different situations. So for example, an example of uh, wrathful compassion, just to cut to the chase in this particular situation, would be a mother who sees a child reaching out to touch a stove. And the mother yells and swats the child's hand away from the stove. And the child cries. And we would think of that as being something which is so harsh if we didn't understand the possible ramifications of the child getting third-degree burns all over its hands. Now, the thing about wrathful compassion is the quality of regret that one has for what one has just done. But I'm going to elaborate next week more on what I call the two last forms of compassion that has to do with magnetizing or charismatic compassion and wrathful compassion. What I want to focus on right now are the first two, which you could say are the more peace, peaceful forms of compassion and how they translate into our civil communication and interaction with each other. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read that section of my book and then expound on it a little bit more. And this has to do with pacifying or peaceful compassion, which is the civility which um, most of us think of as being civil. In this situation, there is harmonious, empathic resonance amongst all proponents of a given direction or action. Conversations and actions feel like everyone is on the same page, or at least able to work with each other with a minimal of friction. The image is one of a team, and regardless of the part you play on that team, everyone is valued equally for their contribution. This is the ideal, and often people want to project that that is exactly what's going on. The language and actions taken are done all so pleasantly, thus the ideal of what it means to be civil. But such civility is very conditional and perhaps fragile. Thus there can be undermining shock or dismay when it is discovered that somewhere down the line, unexpected or unanticipated subconscious agendas begin to surface. The larger picture or issues may seem to be seen by all as, as if in agreement. But we must remember that the devil is in the details, always. Because of the seeming simpatico, people become lazy and don't necessarily really engage the first three wisdoms thoroughly. And if you call, I've talked about the five uh, acts of wise action. And the first three are, can we step back in a situation? Can we properly assess and judge a situation? And how much do we 
allow ourselves to feel a part of the situation with a sense of resonance and what our part is in the situation. Those are the first three things you need to do that are so important to any of these ways in which civility is being displayed and exemplified. This actually makes this form of compassion the hardest to practice skillfully because discernment seems unnecessary. In other words, we get lazy. We assume, wow, everybody is there. And in many respects, what I would say is some of the organizations that are worst in that and the problems that arise because of that sort of like nudge, nudge, wink, wink, where we all think we're on the same page is a kind of smugness that begins to emerge. And the smugness is actually the reactive pattern that you really need to guard against when it comes to the, uh, this particular form of compassion. But the organizations, as I was mentioning, that seem to be most in trouble with this are those that feel like there's a calling, maybe a religious organization or an NGO, where we are basically supposedly aligning ourselves to the philosophy, the morality, the concept of God, on and on and on, uh, what the mission is in terms of whether it's equality or the overcoming of racism or the transformation of anti-Semitism, on and on and on. But then there is the devil in the details, which makes it so that suddenly um, people's agendas begin to come out. And so what happens is as a, a course of action, we sort of like go along as if there aren't really disagreements. We don't really explore the details well. And then we get disappointed to find out that your particular agenda to get whatever the action is to be done is not the agenda of the other person. And suddenly it becomes um, backbiting and actually can become quite destructive, where you went from the most peaceful to the most destructive. It's kind of like, in many respects, the oriental notion of the um, of what's got a front's got a back. The bigger the front, the bigger the back. The more you think you're on the same page, there's a greater likelihood that you're suddenly going to find yourself not on the same page. So in terms of this form of civility, where it really looks like everybody is just so nice and so pleasant, you have to make sure or you have to be wary of this becoming a style rather than an actuality. But of course, it's so pleasant and there are problems. It's oftentimes much harder to uproot and address those things that seem pleasant than those things that are unpleasant. It's very fascinating in the world of Buddhism, and I'm not going to go down too far down this, this rabbit hole with you, but there's considered to be um, six uh, different realms of beings. And you have from the notion of what are called gods, and at the same time, on the other side, beings that are hell beings. And the hell beings are tormented by lots of problems, okay? And it's very difficult for them to get out of hellish situations. But when we are in a God realm, then suddenly what happens is that we assume everything should go our way. I recently had a situation that I was dealing with where someone contacted me um, from a Facebook communication. And what had happened was that this person had communicated with me a year before, but because I hadn't had my messenger linked up and I really wasn't paying attention to messenger all that well, what happened was the person's message got lost. So suddenly a year later, the message pops up. I do not know how that message popped up a year later, but it did. And so I called and I began to talk with the person and it was like, Oh, you know, we're all on the same page with respect to, you know, a philosophy and, and the issues that we're concerned with. And you're, you know, you're a very em empathic person, et cetera, et cetera. But, and what the person went on to say was, you know, 
I kind of forgive you for you not being attentive to what I um, wrote to you that long ago. I mean, you're excused. And suddenly I was being given, um, uh, being excused for something I knew nothing about. And I basically did not want to be or did not feel that I deserved to be shamed of the situation. It was just an acknowledgement of an error. But what ended up happening was, as I said, I really don't want to accept um, the chastisement that you seem to be suggesting uh, is warranted. Suddenly, there became this incredibly belligerent air where the person actually told me to F off and then hung up on me. Very interesting. But it seemed so pleasant in the beginning. So we need to be aware of that smugness and not having it so that civility ends up being a style rather than a real, honest, heart-to-heart -heart form of communication. The next form of compassion is enrichment compassion. And what I say here is to get to a state of harmony in action, there needs to be, in this situation, further education. Thus, civility here is instructional, needing more reasoning, explanation, and a sense of empowering others. In the other situation, you definitely were supposedly on the same page with respect to mutuality, and now you are mutually respecting the other person and their opinion, and at the same time wanting to provide more information and trying to keep it or be on the level with the other person. Enriching them at various levels in order to get them on board or be in alignment with what you want to achieve or express. The role of teacher, mentor, or a reliable source is the civil tone you need to express and direct action from. The tone of civility here is that of the educator or mentor. The challenge and the reactive pattern to safeguard against is condescension. In other words, you end up talking down to people. Okay, There's no smugness in this situation. It's a sense of feeling like, I know better, don't I? And having that implied in words or gestures or affect, that's something we need to be very, very aware of. We're trying to create something where everybody feels empowered to get on with something. That's what's important. A useful phrase when this form of compassion is warranted is, is something like, have you considered? Because really what we're looking at is, how do you consider, how do you create consideration? So in this situation, civility is supported by a much higher level of consideration in the interaction. Like I said, these two the peaceful or pacifying form of compassion and the civility of creates an enrichment compassion or, the, and, or the, the civility that encourages this kind of consideration are the easiest with respect to creating a uh, simpatico amongst people. As I go along next week, I want to address the other two forms that is magnetizing compassion as well as wrathful compassion and the forms of civility that are the result of having that kind of compassionate attitude. But before I go, um, we're coming close to the time when my book, The Path of Civility, is going to be released. And so uh, at the end of this particular podcast, you will see a page which will link you to either going to Amazon to get the book. You can get it in the e-form or a hard copy, or you can contact me through um, my wife and my uh, website, uh, diamondwayayurveda.com, and the links are going to be there. At the same time, 
Um, some of you may or may not know, and I might have mentioned it just uh, a couple times, that I am a member of what's called the Worldwide Civility Council, and we are really trying to encourage people to join us in our efforts by either joining uh, as members of our board or uh, getting involved in the activity that the Civility Council is going to get involved with over the next few years. And there is going to be a place where you can make donations to support the efforts we are trying to get engaged with, including the Urgency of Civility Conference, which is going to be held either in person or virtually or a combination thereof in May of 2021. So at this point, I want to thank you all for listening, and I look forward to speaking with you again in Civility Speaks.